Hey, <clears throat> um, so hello, my name is Gareth Barnaby. I'm a PhD student from um, the Bristol Interaction Group at Bristol University, and I'm supervised by Dr. Anne Riddell. So I'm very excited to um, present you some of my PhD research today, and that is Mantis, which is a um, false feedback system. Um, so false feedback allows users to feel um, 3D virtual environments. Um, so this is an example system that we created with one of the devices um, from, our, from our paper. Um, so when we combine systems like this with virtual reality, users can not only see the virtual world, but they can actually touch and interact with it. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to explain how we designed this system, but let, first let's go into a little bit about why. So first, um, I have a question for you all. Um, so how many of you have used actuation in a project? Can we have a show of hands? Hands up. So who's used something like a DC motor? So let's move on to something a bit more complicated. So uh, a low-end haptic device like a Phantom. Let's have our hands up again. Good number, good. So if we move on to a more complex haptic device like the Phantom Premiums, it's seeing less. And now if we move on to something larger scale like DLR haptic, that kind of thing. Cool. So we um, saw so that not many of us um, have actually um, used, used this kind of technology in our projects. Um, so this might not be too, too surprising for um, HCI, um, but I still think it's a bit odd. So we've seen, like, especially in even recent history, um, many HCI applications off um, force feedback systems or more generally actuation systems. So even at US last year, we had um, examples in Trustformer, so big actuated um, mechanical <coughs> systems. Um, MetaArms, which is once again large scale actuation. Um, a bit in Dual Panto, so uh, small scale uh, haptic interaction. And even in the design competition, we're working with small scale actuation systems. So this made us ask the question um, what if everyone could have access to this kind of high quality force feedback technology? Um, so this is why we made Mantis. Um, we think with this kind of technology, we can unlock um, a wide range of possibilities for end users. So um, why are the current sort of especially high quality force feedback devices so secluded? Um, we're going to visualize this with end diagram. So first, um, we'll draw a circle of applications. So this is the applications that can benefit from um, the addition of force feedback. So generally, this technology is useful in 3D virtual environments. Um, so things like 3D design, 3D CAD modeling. Um, immersive environments for um, like data analysis, um, so you can interact with the data and scroll through it. Um, they use a lot in things like medical training um, and general training. Uh, also things like teleoperation, so they're used in systems like optical tweezers to manipulate matter on very small scales. Um, the list goes on. So now if we also um, add a circle for mechanical factors. So here we're looking at um, the mechanical properties of the devices themselves. So we've got things like the quality of the feedback. Um, so you get a big range in quality. And so lower cost devices um, tend to produce less lower quality feedback than high, high cost devices. Um, form factors, so whether it's like an actuated arm style device, whether it's a string-based string display, um, or whether you're delivering feedback, say a fingertip or to your arm or to your foot maybe. Um, so then also workspace, so workspace is talking about how much physical space we can use the device within. So a small, small arm you only get um, sort of this much space to move your hand in. If you get a much bigger arm you can use a lot more of your, um, your body's range. And also like the maximum force these devices can produce. So we see um, a crossover between applications and, the, and um, the devices themselves. So some, basically some, some applications are suited to some devices. So you don't, there's not like a one device fits all. Um, so a lot of devices are limited, for example, by their workspace and their maximum force and their quality. And it's particularly true of cheaper devices. So for that reason, some devices will not be suitable to some applications. So now we'll add on, um, so barriers for accessibility. So to clarify, we're talking about um, the devices being accessible to applications, not necessarily to the end users here. So cost is a really big one for force feedback devices. Um, current runs, even the lower quality ones, are very expensive. And if you want to get a high quality one, you're looking at um, a lot of money to get, to get access to that device. Um, programming them is not easy. Um, you need generally programming experts or people who are very good with the technology to create anything with them. And procurement is actually difficult. Like you can't just buy, buy these things on Amazon. So once again, we get a bit of a crossover here. So we're looking at, we get a crossover um, of applications that have 
um, devices that are accessible to them. Now, when we sort of put, put this into the current pool of devices, we see, we see these crossovers as kind of like almost mutually exclusive. So if you have a device and an application, you'll find that that device tends to either be ideal mechanically for that application, so it's got a good workspace, good, um, good quality, and good um, maximum force for, for that application, or it's accessible so you can afford it and you can get your hands on it and you can program with it. But it's very rare that you get um, both of those things at the same time. So that's why we want to create Mantis. So we want to make devices that are suitable to a wide range of applications whilst also being accessible. Um, to them. So um, this is a video from our, um, well, the video we submitted. So just to show um, the kind of device we've been creating with it. So yeah, let's let that run. All right, so let's have um, a look at the actual system in a bit more detail. So I'm going to explain the um, desi design side of how Mantis fits into both of these overlaps that we've, we've identified. So I'm going to start talking about how we um, cater to the mechanical properties, and then I'm going to move on to the accessibility aspects, and finally we'll go on to some, some example applications. So let's start with the mechanical properties. So here we want to make devices that can cater to a wide range of applications. So um, this, what this means is that some applications, they require larger workspaces and some of them don't. So how can we cater to both? Uh, the answer to that is scalability. Um, so in our paper, we demonstrate that um, our system is actually very scalable. We can make devices in both small workspaces and large workspaces all with the same system. Um, so both the example devices that you saw in that video, they're actually um, the exact same electronics, same motors, same sensors. It's like the same guts of a robot, just with a different mechanical structure built around it. Um, so the desktop size one um, is about the same as the Phantom Premium 1.5 in terms of the size. Um, the large one is just, it's large. <laughs> um, so there's a bar chart showing the total workspace of the device there. So um, about five, five cubic meters of usable space with the big one. Um, so interesting thing um, with the system by doing this, um, scaling within that large workspace, we can maintain the maximum force they can produce. Um, so we have characterized the example devices in our paper. Um, the method for doing that is in the paper. Um, but you can see we can actually produce still the same kind of torques um, between the pre phantom premiums and the phantom premiums high force, even within these larger workspaces. So um, moving on to quality of feedback. So um, maintaining the quality of feedback within these kind of workspaces. Um, the controller itself can happily render um, shapes with a stiffness of 3.5 newtons per millimeter. Um, this is about the same as phantom premiums. Um, it is worth noting that um, real-world performance is actually also very dependent on the device mechanics. So the controller's quality can very easily be bottlenecked by, um, like, if, if your actual mechanical parts are bending. So it's kind of like a, the controller can do that well. Um, the mechanical device, the actual uh, performance depends on the mechanical device you put on it as well. Um, the control can take um, target force updates at a rate of one kilohertz. So that's 1,000 times a second you can update how much force um, the device is producing. Uh, this is pretty standard for high resolution haptics, so it's about the same as the phantoms. Okay, so how do we actually achieve this um, scalability whilst maintaining the force, force um, capabilities and the quality? So the answer to that is admittance control. So we have a flexible admittance control scheme running these, running these devices. So and that looks a bit like this. Um, so we've got two control loops. Um, the outer black path is the control loop to a computer, so this is the bit that's running at one kilohertz. And then on the inside, we've got the orange um, admittance control loop, so this is the loop that's running on the device itself. So let's simplify this a bit just to um, look at the admittance control and the effect that has. So um, simply, it works by taking um, a measurement of the current force from the device itself, um, it compares that to its target, which is set by the computer, and it adjusts its motors to try and achieve that target force. Now, um, the important thing about admittance control is looking at how we get this estimate of current force, or um, more accurately, it's about where we get this estimate of current force. So on the right there is um, looking at more, more sort of typical impedance control devices. Um, they get the estimate of current force from the base of the robot, whereas with admittance control, we put a force sensor on the end of the robot. Now the effect of this is our controller that we saw that saw in the last slide, when we set a target force, it implements that at the point of feedback. 
So for impedance control, that target force is implemented at the base of the robot. So any of the mechanics, so if you get the weight of the arm, um, the inertia, any friction in the joints, it gets added on to the force it produces. Now with impedance control, um, all of those effects are encompassed within the control loop. So all of the weight of the device, um, any friction, any cogging in the motors, any friction, again, <laughs> um, is compensated for within the control loop. So now this allows us to scale to much larger workspaces because um, one, it enables us to use um, different motor technologies so we can use more efficient motors and um, more, tra more robust transmissions. Um, so it allows us to produce the higher torques we need for these larger workspaces. Um, so it also means physically bigger devices are possible because you're not feeling the weight of the linkage on your finger. So now I'm gonna move a bit onto the accessibility um, side of things, so how do we make Mantis an accessible system, make it easy to work with um, for, for users? So first thing is cost. Um, so uh, in our paper, the two devices we showed, the desktop one cost less than $500 for us to build, um, the large workspace one cost less than $800 to build. It still sounds like quite a bit, but it's quite a step down from um, things of comparable quality on the market at the minute. So how do we actually make, make them cheap? Um, so this once again comes back to our impedance control loop. So starting with the motor technology. So earlier I was talking about um, we can use new motor technologies. Specifically, this is brushless motors. Um, so you can't normally use brushless motors in impedance devices because you get um, effects like cogging and motor braking within them. Um, so our emittance control loop doesn't mind that, so we can add, add them into this. So, um, so the higher efficiency of brushless motors mean that, especially desktop um, size devices, we don't need any transmission at all. We can bolt the arm sections directly onto the motor, so we save a lot, of, a lot in manufacturing, a lot in assembly. Um, so admittance control uh, also allows us to use cheaper transmissions. So in the large workspace, we're using timing belt drives. Um, we can use these because, um, so normally in impedance control devices, these would introduce friction, which would be bad. Um, in the case of emittance control, we're compensating for that friction, so we can use them. Um, it also ties into the mechanical design, um, so we can use the, the sort of cheaper, cheaper materials and higher friction parts. So one issue with emittance control is the 3D, we need a 3D4 sensor, and that's not, not cheap and it's not easy to put on the end of a device. So we built our own, um, less than $10, so it's based on laser cut acrylic with um, the same kind of load cells that we saw earlier glued onto it. So it's easy sort of DIY approach. Um, since then, we've made one based on the PCB instead of the laser cut acrylic. So cost was not the only barrier to application that we identified. Um, how can we make them easy to create with? So as we mentioned earlier, they're connected via Ethernet. So we've got a server application that will run in, your, run in a desktop machine or a laptop, um, which manages all the devices. It will talk to them. It will handle the API for you. And then you can talk to this server just with sockets and Ethernet sockets. So pretty much any application that can run sockets, so C code, um, Python, Java, anything, um, can talk to these devices. So what kind of things can we put here? So first off, we can interface them quite easily with anything like Open Haptics or Kai 3D for the more realistic haptic rendering. Um, but I think more interestingly, we've done it with Unity. Now, um, so we don't get the sort of very high realistic um, haptic, haptic rendering with this, um, but what it does do is it makes it incredibly easy for people, to, especially novices, to create with force feedback systems. Um, so cost was one thing, so how can we make them easy to procure? Um, we're open sourcing it. So first off, we've done a step-by-step -step sort of um, IKEA style guide for um, the desktop device in our paper. This is gonna be available online along with all the designs, so you can download the files and laser cut your own. Um, so I'm also hopefully planning to launch a startup company to sell parts, kits, and ready-to-use devices. So we'll quickly go through some example, some example applications. Um, so we got the two devices we've already seen in the paper. And um, we showed you this one at the beginning, which is just a combination. So a large, large workspace four-point system we built with four of the devices. And we could do the same thing in a smaller workspace. So this is the system we were demoing on Monday. And we can also put them in mobile, mobile workspaces or um, wearable systems. So I think also in future we can scale to a lot of different form factors. So I'd be very interested in looking into it, for example, foot-based foot haptics. So VR still has like a locomotion problem. It would be very interesting to try strapping some of these devices onto your feet to try and fix that. So to summarize, um, Mantis is an accessible, scalable system. Um, we can create force feedback devices suitable and accessible to a wide range of applications and users. 
Um, we're very excited to present it to you and hope we can see more kind of projects with this technology in the future. So just to wrap up a bit quickly, um, I want to go through my personal motivation for this project. Um, so there's numerous examples of projects or devices that have taken secluded technologies and made them very easily accessible. Um, so these include Oculus, so with DK1 kicked off um, sort of current big wave of VR headsets that are going on. Um, MakerBot, very similar with 3D printing. And Arduino with embedded electronics, like a lot of the demos here, we're running Arduinos now. So these examples show how making a technology affordable, flexible, and accessible can lead to a large increase in use of that technology. So false feedback is, I think, a really cool technology that hasn't, hasn't been fully realized for quite a long time. I think it's really got the potential to change how, how we think about and interact with our computer programs. So the demo that I hope a lot of you saw on Monday is just the beginning. There's a lot, a lot more we can do with this and a lot more ideas we can explore with this technology. I really want to get this project um, into the hands of as many people as possible and try and get loads of people creating with it. So if you are interested in working with Force Feedback or Mantis, please do get in touch. I want to hear from you and I want to, want to work with you. Cool, that's all. Questions? <laughs> Questions? Is uh, Andy in here? Oh, oh, sorry, were you just... <laughs> you didn't expect... Sorry, I didn't see it. It's really nice work. The demo was very impressive. You know, one of the things that, um, when I first tried the Phantom, that was just so impressive about the device was its ability to render texture. And that's all about the bandwidth of the actuation. So you mentioned that you have um, one kilohertz uh, control can you just comment on the ability of your device to render textures? Um, so, so far we've only actually tried it within the Unity simulations. So in terms of um, sort of the bandwidth, you end up looking into essentially the stiffness of the device and the, the, um, the rate at which it achieves its force targets, right? Um, so we've characterized those in the paper. Um, so basically we can achieve re reasonably good haptic, um, haptic quality with, with the rendering itself. Um, a lot of what, what you would have seen in the demo is um, Unity's physics engine, which can't, can't supply the information to deliver on that. Um, but, yeah, hopefully with, like, if we interface it with something like Open Haptics or Kai 3D, I don't know how to pronounce it, it might be Che, <laughs> um, you'll, be, you'll be able to get much, much more realistic rendering with it. Thank you. Hi, Robert Kovac from Hustle Partner Institute. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful talk. Uh, I was just wondering if you can use this device also as an output device, like a robotic arm or, or manipulator in the same way. Is that work? Yes, so absolutely. Um, in, in the essence of them, they're just um, force control robots. They're a robot arm with a force sensor on the end of it. Um, so they've got the position feedback in them, so you can, you can use them as a force or position control device. Um, the actual robots you were demoing had um, a bit of both in them, so um, you saw the demo, right? So if you take your finger out of it, it sort of goes into a position control mode where it sort of pulls back and then waits for you to put your finger back in. Um, so it's yeah. stable in the same way if you don't have the admittance control at the end or, or the feedback. Yeah, exactly. So you can't, um, so admittance control, it needs, it needs to be grounded at the end. Um, so if you don't have that point of force feedback, it's, you know, if you get a bit of drift in the sensors, it'll sort of go, <laughs> um, So. You, you, need, you need to be actually interacting with something to use admittance control. Um, but when you're running and moving into the position control mode, you just sort of switch that off and just run on the encoders, position encoders. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, why don't you let the next speaker set up? And as he does it, I, I want to ask one last question, which is uh, how the important part of the accessibility, since you stated that as a major goal for this, it's impressive work even without that is, is uh, how hard is it to actually make and build one of these? You said kits, but like how long would it take someone with a bit of hands-on experience to be able to design a version and build it? Um, so that very much depends on the device itself. Um, so the desktop size device we had in the paper, um, it's literally you just need a screwdriver. Um, all the electronics are plug and play. Um, you just plug, plug in the motors, you plug in the encoders, um, and the rest of it you just bolt it all together. And um, as so I said, we've got for the desktop device, um, we've got the IKEA style guide. So if you are interested in, in how to build them, um, look that up. So it really is, really is fairly simple. It's just putting screws in the right places. Okay. Looking forward to trying it. Okay, so uh, another round of applause. And we have our 